So at this time, we're going to go to second reading for Centerville Elementary Zoning Plan. Board, this is for information only. We will not be voting on this tonight. We'll, we will be voting next month on this. And I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Salters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there we go. Um, we, uh, <coughs> we're talking about second reading of the Centerville attendance lines uh, this evening. Um, and just to recap, we had first reading last month, and then we have since had two community meetings, as uh, has previously been discussed, uh, where we received input at Gilbert Elementary School um, and uh, Gilbert Primary School. Um, and Ms. Sill just gave me a kind of a, a number here that we received like 49 uh, pieces of feedback from those meetings. Um, obviously, that information was um, assimilated and um, referred to, to the school board uh, for input and um, discussion and uh, the senior leadership team and, and members of the staff at Central Services uh, has had much discussion uh, regarding that feedback uh, since those uh, meetings occurred. And so tonight we're looking at um, second reading. Um, and just to remind you, um, you know, our considerations when we're looking at doing uh, a rezoning effort is we're trying to use our facilities as efficiently as possible uh, minimizing subdivisions, um, you know, balancing student demographics where possible, allowing future student growth in our permanent facilities. Um, we do look at transportation patterns for efficient and safe student transportation. And we uh, try to use natural and major road boundaries where possible uh, so that the lines are easily identifiable um, in the community. And so um, second reading, um, this is a rendering of, of Centerville Elementary. You'll actually see some uh, pictures later on in the meeting of the construction progress. Um, we, we looked at the themes um, that were um, pulled together in this, um, in this uh, group of feedback, and we, we came up with three major themes. Um, one was travel concerns. Um, another was daycare concerns. And then uh, the last uh, major theme was immersion program considerations. And so uh, obviously there were a few, you know, um, other ideas and, and concepts that were, that were brought forward, but these were the most common uh, themes that were um, addressed in the feedback. And so I just want to take a uh, little bit deeper look at, at these. Um, so just to remind you um, kind of what we're talking about, you know, this, this entire area is the current um, Gilbert Elementary, Gilbert Primary attendance zone, uh, which is uh, a third of our school district. Uh, so it's a tremendously large area um, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, the size of, of uh, what we're trying to work with here. Um, and I've showed this, this slide before, but um, in the lower area here uh, of the um, the proposed new Centerville zone, you're about eight and a half or 8.8 .8 miles from Centerville, uh, about four miles on this side, actually about 9.7 uh, from the, the top side up here. Um, and then in Gilbert Elementary, the further distances are 12 and a half miles and about 10.6 miles in, in this area here. Uh, <clears throat> and so one of the areas of, of feedback that we received uh, mostly uh, with concerns with travel distance was really right in this area right here. Uh, and I'll just kind of zoom in on that. Um, there are about 68 students um, in, in this area. This is Perry Taylor Road for your reference uh, here. Um, and so 68 students in this area. And so, you know, the consideration was uh, the thought of maybe moving that line, um, you know, north of, of Perry Taylor or using Perry Taylor as, as the line. Uh, and you can see the difficulty in, in doing that when you take 68 students from um, Centerville and put them back at Gilbert Elementary School. Um, you, you put Gilbert Elementary School um, basically at, at almost over capacity, and then Centerville would be underutilized at that point. So um, that's one of the, the, the concerns that, that we're, we're dealing with there. And so um, one of the recommending, recommendations that we're proposing this evening to try to address some of, of that concern, uh, because understand that there are a number of folks in this area, um, you know, that are, are pleased with the lines. Um, and, you know, we had some feedback from folks here that are, you know, pleased with, with um, going to Centerville. <clears throat> so what our recommendation right now is um, assuming that the lines uh, remain as they are drawn, um, 
we would recommend that student services be able to um, employ 10 school choice slots uh, for each school uh, to allow for uh, folks in this area um, the potential to choice into um, Gilbert Elementary School should they choose to do that. Um, <clears throat> and that would require they provide transportation um, to Gilbert Elementary. Across the district when we do school choice, um, those slots are, are not uh, picked up by buses. They're required uh, to have uh, their own transportation. And if we have more than 10, how do you handle that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, student services uh, conducts a, a lottery, uh, which is handled in accordance with board policy. Uh, there's actually a school choice policy um, that describes that. And so um, uh, they would conduct a lottery uh, to um, apply those slots. So that's our recommendation, assuming the lines would, would stay as, as they are uh, recommended in second reading uh, to address the, you know, the feedback of travel concerns in that area. Because as we said, you know, not all 68 students in that area um, had travel concerns. Uh, and so uh, we felt like that would uh, be a help to meet, meet that need. <clears throat> Looking at daycare concerns, um, one of the, the, the biggest concern that we heard um, really came out of, uh, there were a couple of individual situations, but um, generally speaking, the, the bigger concerns were um, there are two daycares um, located on Broad Street, and they are um, Learn to Grow and the Leisure Center, and they're on the Gilbert Elementary School side of Broad Street. Um, and uh, so the concern was that students attending Centerville Elementary uh, would not have the ability to uh, have transportation um, to those two um, daycare facilities. And so, um, you know, one thing to, to remind folks is that uh, Centerville will be working on a, an after school program. Um, and so that obviously is one option. But secondary to that, assuming that the lines were to stay as they're drawn here, um, we would be bringing a bus down um, Broad Street from Centerville, um, and because it's on that street already, uh, we, would, we would be able to drop students at Learn to Grow and uh, Leisure Center from Centerville uh, so to, to alleviate that, um, that transportation concern for those two um, facilities. So that's, um, that's our recommendation. <clears throat> um, and so we, we would you know, consider serving all the daycares on Broad Street regardless of school lines if, if the lines were to remain as, as they're drawn. So um, really trying to get to that feedback about, about that daycare concern as well. Mr. Salters, I think there was a concern about the Big Blue Marble. I think that's the name of it, daycare. And I think you talked with the director. Well, so Big Blue Marble, um, from, from our understanding and, and you know, feedback that we've gotten, has actually two locations. Um, one location, whoops, one location is located here um, right, right down the street from um, Gilbert Elementary School. And the other location is actually up in the um, Centerville attendance zone, actually right down the street from Centerville Elementary School. So they actually have two locations that are um, close to, to the facilities. Um, so it appears that those two um, locations will work out just fine. And so um, immersion considerations, um, you know, one of the things that we, we looked at um, in, in conversations and feedback that we got was to have all of the immersion programs at one school. Um, and so um, that's, that's something that we looked at um, and did some analysis on. Um, and when you bring in, one thing you have to remember is we're dealing essentially with two schools worth of immersion students um, because you have a third of the district, right? Um, and you currently are operating two schools. They're just combined grade spans. And so those facilities were set up and designed. You know, that primary school we added kindergarten classrooms to uh, to handle it as a primary school. And so a typical elementary school doesn't have, you know, the, the size and scope of those uh, classrooms. So you run into some, some space limitations, um, you know, if you house everything at, at Centerville with the type of classrooms that you might need um, to, to um, operate that, that facility. Um, and then you also get into a situation um, in, in the district historically when we have done a rezoning effort, um, when we've had an immersion program at a school, 
and rezoned, um, we have not provided transportation for anyone who's out of zone that now attends that school. Um, we, we just don't have the busing facilities to be able to drive out of zone and pick up students. So theoretically, if you housed it at Gilbert Elementary School, as an example, um, all of the Centerville students would have to provide their own transportation. Um, and vice versa, if you housed it at Centerville, all the Gilbert Elementary students would have to provide their own transportation. And so we did some analysis on um, the busing situation and who, who of these students rides the bus. Uh, there are a considerable number of students that participate in immersion that ride the bus um, more after school than before. Um, but, but on both ends of the equation, there are, are bus riders involved, and so we would be restricting uh, their access potentially to the program. And so another uh, theme that came out uh, was could we look at grandfathering certain grade levels um, and um, housing, you know, say grades three through five at, um, I'll just say Centerville Elementary School, for example, <clears throat> and then have K-2 programs at each, each school. Um, and so as we started looking into that and trying to um, manipulate and move kids to where they would need to be, um, it, it became very problematic because you ended up having um, elementary students split between two campuses. Um, you know, I, my, my brother is going, is in third grade, so they've got to go to Centerville. I'm a kindergartner, so I've got to go to Gilbert Elementary School. Um, and so you're starting to split siblings, and it became, it became very problematic to uh, try to work that out. Um, and so that really hasn't been a, a, an idea that um, we feel is really viable. Another thought was to, to operate some uh, form of shuttles uh, between the schools. Um, and, and so uh, the idea there was if you were going to attend Centerville, <clears throat> maybe you could get to Gilbert Elementary School on a bus, and then the bus would take you to Centerville um, or vice versa. The challenge with the shuttle system um, uh, is, number one, the time that it takes to um, ride that bus is lost instruction time. So if I ride a bus and I arrive at Gilbert Elementary School and then I'm shuttled to Centerville, you know, that 15 minutes in the morning, uh, I've lost instruction. Same thing in the afternoon because I've got to get back, catch my afternoon bus. Uh, reality is, you know, you could lose 30 to 45 minutes a day of instruction just in transportation back and forth. Um, and, and so that, that time is too precious uh, to our, our elementary folks and, and we didn't feel like that was a, a really practical approach. Um, either. <clears throat> so um, at, at this point, uh, after considering everything that we're looking at, the recommendations that we um, are putting out is, is, again, full immersion programs at both Gilbert Elementary and Centerville. Um, you'll have smaller class sizes uh, for a few years at each location, um, but I think ultimately the smaller class sizes are what everyone is looking for. Um, Mr. Salters and Dr. Talley, you may jump in. I know Mr. Reynolds had a question about class sizes. Do you have like a general idea of numbers that we're talking about to help answer his question? Well, if, if I can say, so part of the challenge there obviously is where the lines where, where the lines end up, right? So, um, but if you just kind of look at it at the moment, the class sizes would be smaller, especially in those upper grades. Um, now you still don't exactly know, uh, well, and he'll get through like the immersion students who live outside of Gilbert and some of those types of things, but the, the class sizes in third, fourth, and fifth grade, especially fourth and fifth grade would be smaller, uh, because you're talking, you're, you're cutting a, you're cutting that pie down one more, uh, but it's for, also for the next couple but years. for the next couple of years, but they'll grow into that. And I think when we were having the conversation, we said, well, we would rather have, instead of people have to choose between transportation and education, we would rather provide the education in both places um, and make sure that um, that everybody had the opportunity to do it and that you didn't have to, well, I ride the bus in the afternoon so I can't participate, or I ride the bus in the morning and I can't participate some, for, some, for whatever reason. Um, and also keeping in mind the logistical challenge of breaking up 125 square miles um, and then trying to offer one location in terms of immersion. And I, and I don't know, as, as we tried to brainstorm that entire experience, it was very difficult to try and think of a solution that would capture all of those factors, except for this one. You know, and, and additionally, um, 
with the class size is one of the things that we've we've spoken with the principals about and and something that that they're um actually doing now and and will continue to do is, is a two-way immersion experience <clears throat> and and that's where students uh, w that are native speaking um are actually tested and and could potentially be placed into those upper grade levels assuming they pass you know a, a regular standard of test they're not just going to put them in there because um, that they speak the native language, they have to um, meet certain standards and, and be able to keep up in the class. And so if they are, they, they are able to be added to, to the class and offer that um, additional support and benefit for really speakers of both languages in that scenario. So there are opportunities to add students to those classes as we, as we go forward. And as Dr. Little mentioned, um, this scenario does provide transportation for all students. Um, and so the, that, that takes away that limitation um, for access to the program. Um, and then currently immersion students who live outside of the Gilbert attendance area, so the current um, Gilbert Elementary and Primary area, um, will either be placed at Gilbert Elementary or Centerville based on the grade level enrollments um, as, as those um, develop. Um, and so um, taking on this, this approach again, we're, we're looking at the projected enrollment being you know, 705 and, and 816. Now you add 10 choice slots to each of these and those numbers could grow because um, board, as you're aware, when, when you choice, it's a family choice. And so if you know, a fifth grader uh, gets that slot and they have two siblings, that's actually three students um, and those other students continue that choice on through the family legacy as well. So um, those numbers could grow by 15 or 20, um, you know, just as a result of choice um, and uh, approving that recommendation. So that's a ballpark uh, enrollment number there. And, and again, we're, we're looking at the lines um, that, we, that we've presented. Um, we, we didn't have any real um, compelling feedback at this point to, to, to shift anything, um, you know, we, on Wire Road to Louie, to Broad Street, to Green Hills Drive, to Kraut Pond, um, and then on over to um, AC Balk Night, Camp Branch, and Two Notch. Um, and again, trying to address some of that feedback in this area through choice, uh, because, you know, we had a number of folks who were, who were very interested and pleased who live in this area with the lines as well as um, folks who were, you know, who were concerned and wanted to, to stay where they were. So um, we, uh, as mentioned, immersion would be offered at both schools. The three and four year old programs would be offered at um, Gilbert Elementary School, 4K at, at Centerville, um, and no grandfathering at this time. Um, and then three and four year olds ultimately would end up moving to uh, in that Gilbert Tennessee area, we move to an early childhood center um, in the future as that space is developed and repurposed at the current Gilbert Elementary School location. Key dates, just call your attention to these um, as we've gone through. Just remember that, um, you know, we've had these meetings, public hearings, and then uh, second reading is tonight. Third reading will be um, at the um, March meeting. And of course, between now and March, um, we will continue to receive feedback, um, and hopefully tonight's discussion will have um, spawned some other ideas and thoughts, um, and we'll receive additional feedback for consideration, and we will continue to monitor that feedback um, and, and come up with ideas and suggestions and make, make adjustments um, and look for your feedback as well uh, for consideration uh, before a third reading um, in March. And so with that, I'll answer any questions you have as a board. Thank you, Doc. Mr. Salters, are there any questions or comments for Mr. Salters or Dr. Talley? And I understand uh, Mr. Branham and I think Ms. Mr. Moody are here too as well. They're, they're welcome to join in if anybody has any questions or comments. I have a few comments. I think more so than class size, the students that are in third, fourth, well, will be third, fourth, fifth next year, they want those students to stay together, the parents do. And we've gotten a couple of emails from teachers, one which was very, um, she put a lot of work into this proposal. Um, has the senior leadership team had a chance to look at the proposal that the board got from a teacher this morning? Yeah, so we talked about that today. One of the critical pieces of that particular plan was the shuttle bus. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really fleshed out that as an issue. And um, 
again, from the shuttle bus perspective, if you're, say, for example, you would put the immersion program at Centerville Elementary School, the shuttle bus would have to come to Gilbert after everybody's run the routes and then go from Gilbert back. And then in the afternoon, they would have to leave early so the folks at Gilbert Elementary School could catch their buses home. So that loss of instructional time is, uh, is really what we prioritized when we started talking about the shuttle buses. Okay, I'd be interested in seeing how many students will be on these buses. I know I talked about this during the first um, rezoning we went through last year. I think there needs to be an additional meeting between second reading and third reading with the stakeholders because we get feedback, but then as a board, this is what we have to discuss is on the night of the meeting and we're presented the lines and we really don't have to, time to discuss what's went on between first and second reading. And then when third reading shows up, we don't have time to discuss that with the stakeholders. In other districts, I've noticed, I would like to see this, I mentioned this during our last rezoning as well, I would like to see us put together a committee, um, a couple of the teachers that emailed us, some bus drivers, the principals, um, some staff to talk about how we can make this work because they've made very good points about why the immersion students that are currently together should be grandfathered in. Okay. I mean, as a committee, that would be the board's responsibility. Is that something that the board could put together? Would be some kind of ad hoc committee between now and third reading? Um, we'd have to talk about it. I, I'm not sure that the board would. I, I think the method we have now, we've had two community meetings where people were given information, allowed to ask questions. They've also been able to communicate with us. They can, they've submitted responses. They can call us. They can email us. They can ask to meet with us in person. Um, as you know, it is against the law for us to have more than three people at a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't just call an ad hoc meeting. This is the best forum for this. That's what we're doing tonight. That's why we allowed them to talk, and they will have another opportunity to address us before the next meeting, and they'll have plenty of time. If they want to call us individually, write us letters, email us, um, it's just we're so constrained by the laws that govern this board. That's why the committee would not have board members on it. It would just be members well, of the community. I think Mr. Branham and Mr. Moody, I think you have met with your teachers. I know you've met with Dr. Speaks. I know you've met with Dr. Talley. Um, I know you've had extensive conversations in your own schools and with your parents. So. But we aren't, as a board, like the two parents who came in here tonight and spoke to us, like we can't respond to them. And like the man said, when are y'all going to answer all these questions? I mean, and that's a good question. These people have very good questions, like when are they going to get answers? Well, I think a lot of the questions were answered tonight. I don't think so, looking back okay. at some of these questions in here. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Garris. Any other comments or questions, board? So as a parent who's never, I've always been jealous of the immersion schools because we've, you know, we've just never been zoned for one. Would splitting the immersion programs to the two schools create more capacity for us as a district? Um, because, you know, when I think about our district, district, it's the academic rigor, and then it's our, our world language focus and our arts focus. I think that, you know, it's why people move. So would this create, so I'm, I'm thinking at the 10,000 foot view for the Gilbert community, would this ultimately long term, because it's going to cost us more money, I'm sure, but give us more capacity for students to, to be bilingual? Sure. When we look at the projected numbers, um, Dr. Powers and, and others, um, in our earlier grades, we were already seeing the numbers larger than, in, as Dr. Little mentioned, third, fourth, and fifth grade. And as already has been mentioned, we feel like those smaller numbers at those uh, upper grades will be temporary, and the district's willing to commit to providing the support we need for those smaller classes right now because we do feel like uh, the program is, as you know, an exemplary program, and we feel like that in the Gilbert community, we're gonna only grow that program in both those schools and offer great uh, instruction to both sites. And that was the, uh, when, when I met with the two principals, that was certainly their desire. They both wanted immersion in their buildings. And isn't Spanish our most requested um, immersion language? It is. And it's the easiest language, as Mr. Stacy will tell you, to recruit teachers. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Guyton? Yeah, so uh, one question, one comment. First question, with regard to the, the busing from Centerville to the, the other daycares, are there financial implications uh, to the district involving that? And, and if so, is that kind of an ongoing? How does that look? Well, if we... The further you drive into a zone that, that the bus is not zoned for, so if Centerville bus went into the um, 
the Gilbert Elementary Zone, then there's financial implications as far as the payment to the driver and, and the reimbursement to the state for the mileage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Along with having to pay um, what is equivalent to a hazardous stop because it's a stop that's not you know approved by the State Department uh, by the State Department of Transportation. With this, with being on uh, Broad Street, so while we may have a, a stop that we would have to pay for, a Centerville bus would stop on Broad Street and deliver students to a, a Gilbert address, we wouldn't have the, the implications of probably having to pay for the driver's time and, and pay extra mileage because it would be a part of the route. So to answer your question, there is some financial implications um, and over the course of the year, depending on the number of buses that it would take to do this, uh, it could, could accumulate into a few thousand dollars. I don't have an exact figure. But essentially, it's you're saying it's, for the most part, mitigated by the fact of where the location of the line is by right. simply being on Broad Street. That's right. And having Gilbert on one side, Centerville on the other, it helps to mitigate those costs. That's exactly right, because the bus is not having to go and drive into a, the out-of-zone area. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I, I guess comment-wise, I think of, of the three themes, um, and, and I would completely echo everything that, that you put up there regarding the, the three concerns that we have gotten feedback on, travel, daycare, and immersion. Probably the most prevalent theme I have seen there um, has been the immersion. Um, I get, well, I guess I do have a question. When families sign up, elect for their child to go into immersion, what's the sort of the philosophical how do we approach that philosophically? How do, how do we approach that in terms of the cohort, the, the students, the relationships? Because I heard a lot about relationships and these children together, these children together. My children have never been in an immersion program, so I, I, we, we have never had that experience. But I'm just curious, what, what's the philosophy that, that we instill there? Sure. <laughs> well, as you know, I am an immersion parent, um, fourth grader at Pleasant Hill Elementary School. But what I'd like to do is we have Dr. Liza Spies here today, um, and I'm going to surprise her just a second. If we could get her, if uh, somebody could get her a microphone, because I'd like for her to talk about that particular piece of it as we approach that philosophically. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for um, giving me the chance to speak. So. Uh, the philosophical piece that you asked about in terms of our commitment to the classes and the cohort has to do with academic rigor and the, the experience that we're going to provide for our students is one that is going to help them become bilingual and biliterate and also um, do very well in their content area subjects that they're learning. There's no particular um, the purpose of the program isn't to build, um, isn't specifically to build strong relationships between the kids and the class. The kids do move, but that's a byproduct that comes out of it that many families really appreciate. And some families, you know, kind of would like more intermingling with other students. And so it's sort of a mixed bag in that um, capacity. But what we do find is that we are um, constantly switching kids. So while there are two homerooms, typically in each school, that are immersion, students can switch from one homeroom to another or from one homeroom back to the other homeroom, depending on the year. And so it's not, um, it is possible that students could be in a different homeroom than other kids in immersion. So um, philosophically, our goal is to provide a very strong bilingualism and biliteracy for the kids and we're doing that and I believe that moving to two schools as um, Dr. Power said would provide greater capacity for the Gilbert area and provide more opportunities for immersion for even some of the slightly underserved areas and I think it would be a, a very strong benefit for the Gilbert community to have immersion in both locations. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. I, I guess so, so. What you're saying, you know, based off of the 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 philosophy of the academic rigor, what comes out of that is sort of the natural outpouring of the relationships that develop. Exactly, um, that comes out of the fact that there's only the two groups. Sure. So typically, there's only two homerooms, and so there's only 
two spaces they could move back and forth to. So that's not necessarily the intention or the purpose behind immersion that just right. happens as a right. result, right. yes. And, and I guess that's, therein lies the rub um, because that's, that's the piece that we're getting feedback on is the relationship aspect. That's what we're hearing is, you know, that, um, uh, that there's a, a consistent uh, kind of band, if you will, um, uh, among these students. And, and I get it, trust me. Um, and, and I guess I'm not convinced we have the answer at this point. Um, I think this is a, a temporary issue, if you will, because we're, we're looking at a, um, a group of students who, for an upcoming K through two, it's less of an issue than a three through five, um, is kind of what I'm learning in this. Um, so I, I'm not convinced we have the answer. I, I think the answers are there, somewhere in there. Um, maybe a blended mix, um, but I, I guess if I had a piece of feedback regarding specific to immersion is, it seems like it's a problem that still needs to be worked, would be my, my feedback. So how do you think is a good way to work on that? No clue, but I tell you, the, the email we got was, was fantastic. I, I always enjoy reading a an email where not only do you present a problem but you present a proposed solution that's that's the best way to attack any issue is is to not only offer up the problem but to offer up a, a potential solution um the solution that and this was just one that was emailed to us but you know it, it seems to be a blend of all three of those um outside of the um all at one school location i think the one consistent is that you know, definitely at two schools, but how is that, you know, is there a, a, a mechanism for divide? Um, and that's the, the hard part. Um, I, I can't say I have the solution right now. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not smart enough to figure it out, I can tell you that. Um, but uh, I, I still think it could be worked a little bit. I agree. And, and that's what I'm saying is the people that we're hearing from they have solutions and they're in the schools and they know how this works best like getting them all together and talking about it and getting some answers for these people that have sent in feedback um that's why i think we need another community meeting or some kind of ad hoc committee thank you miss garris any other questions or comments for you? yes well, and i would just are, like to add yeah <laughs> sorry i was gonna say so are we gonna plan any of this because i know you said the board needs to talk about it but this is our talking time between now and third reading well, and, and Ms. Garrison, and I, um, I had actually written down earlier um, during citizens' participation, we need to have a Gilbert community meeting because I think we do need to talk about this again or let the community talk again with perhaps Dr. Little and Mr. Salters. Um, one point I would make, and I th think we haven't talked about that, is um, especially for these older students, third, fourth, and fifth grade. My youngest is a ninth grader now. Um, third, fourth, and fifth grade goes by like that, and these students are all going to be back together in sixth grade. Um, I did not have an immersion student. Um, my children experienced, you know, I think they probably had 10 or 11 different um, third, grade, third grade classes at Midway, and so every year they had a new best friend. Um, and I think that that's something that is valuable for children to learn, that social um, nimbleness and getting along with others. Um, I think it's something that the parents should model a little more, maybe. Um, one of the things that I think we need to keep in mind when we talk about, um, I think we've got some really great suggestions and some ideas, very well thought out. I love the chart um, because I'm a very visual thinker. Um, I do understand the importance of preserving instructional time, and as a board, our job is to consider what's best for all students. Parents, your job is to consider what's best for your student. And so somewhere we have to find where the middle ground is on that. Um, and so I think maybe more discussion. Um, I don't know that necessarily a, another committee is the right way to go about it, um, but I think I, I have no doubt um, that Dr. Little and Mr. Salters and Dr. Talley and Mr. Branham and Mr. Moody are gonna continue to talk to the parents and the stakeholders and they have kept us very well informed on the feedback that, what, that they have received over the last month. Um, and I have no doubt that we will continue to get that feedback. So I really like to just suggest that we let the process continue the way it is supposed to continue. 
um, and see where we are in a couple weeks. Um, and hopefully, maybe, you know, to Dr. Guyton's point, maybe a little bit more clear picture of how the, the best way forward is on this. But I think we need to um, let the process continue to work the I way it's supposed the, to work. I uh, think the introduction of the 10 choice slots may uh, help with a little bit of that too, the angst of the parents. Okay. Okay. Anything else, board? We'll move on.